Chapter 3 Defining and Generating Sleep Time dilation and what we learned from a baby in 1952 Perhaps you walked into your living room late one night while chatting with a friend. You saw a family member, let's call her Jessica, lying still on the couch. Not making a peep, but you were confident and head lolling to one side. Immediately, you turned to your friend and said, Shh, Jessica's sleeping. But how did you know? It took a split second of time, yet there was little doubt in your mind about Jessica's state. Why, instead, did you not think Jessica was in a coma? Or worse, dead. Self-identifying sleep. Your lightning-quick judgment of Jessica being asleep was likely correct, and perhaps you accidentally confirmed it by knocking something over and waking her up. Over time, we have all become incredibly good at recognizing a number of signals that suggest that another individual is asleep. So reliable are these signs that there now exists a set of observable features that scientists agree indicate presence of sleep in humans and other species. The Jessica Vinit illustrates nearly all of these clues. First, sleeping organisms adopt a stereotypical position. In land animals, this is often horizontal, as was Jessica's position on the couch. Second, and related, sleeping organisms have lowered muscle tone. This is most evident in the relaxation of postural, anti-gravity, skeletal muscles, those that keep you upright, preventing you from collapsing to the floor. As these muscles ease their tension in light and then deep sleep, the body will slouch down. A sleeping organism will be dropped over whatever supports it underneath, most evident in Jessica's listing head position. Third, sleeping individuals show no over displays of communication or responsivity. Jessica showed no signs of orienting to you as you entered the room, as she would have when awake. The fourth defining feature of sleep is that it's easily reversible, differentiating it from coma, anesthesia, hibernation, and death. Recall that upon knocking the item over in the room, Jessica awoke. Fifth, as we established in the previous chapter, sleep adheres to a reliable time pattern across 24 hours, instructed by the circadian rhythm coming from the brain's suprachiasmatic nucleus pacemaker. Humans are diurnal, so we have a preference for being awake throughout the day and sleeping at night. Now, let me ask you a rather different question. How do you, yourself, know that you have slept? You make this self-assessment even more frequently than that of sleeping others. Each morning, we'd like you to return to the waking world knowing that you have been asleep. So sensitive is this self-assessment of sleep that you can go a step further gauging when you've had good or bad quality sleep. This is another way of measuring sleep a first-person phenomenological assessment distinct from science that you use to determine sleep in another. Here also, there are universal indicators that offer a convincing conclusion of sleep. Two, in fact. First is the loss of external awareness. You stop perceiving the outside world. You are no longer conscious of all that surrounds you at least not explicitly. In actual fact, your ears are still hearing. Your eyes, though closed, are still capable of seeing. This is similarly true for the other sensory organs of the nose, smell, the tongue, taste, and the skin, touch. All these signals still float into the center of your brain, but it is here in the sensory convergence zone where what that journey ends while you sleep. The signals are blocked by a perceptual barricade set up in a structure called the thalamus. Thalamus. 
a smooth oval shaped object just smaller than a lemon the thalamus is the sensory gate of the brain the thalamus decides which sensory signals are allowed through its gates and which are not should they gain privileged passage they are sent up to the cortex at the top of your brain where they are consciously perceived by locking its gates Shut at the onset of healthy sleep, the thalamus imposes a sensory blackout in the brain, preventing onward travel of those signals up to the cortex. As a result, you are no longer consciously aware of the information broadcasts being transmitted from uh, your outer sense organs. At this moment, your brain has lost waking contact with the outside world that surrounds you. Said another way, you are now asleep. The second feature that extracts your own self-determined judgment of sleep is a sense of time distortion experienced in two contradictory ways. At the most obvious level, you lose your conscious sense of time when you sleep. Don't amount to a chronometric void. Consider the last time you fell asleep on an airplane when you woke up you probably checked a clock to see how long you had been asleep. Why? Because your explicit tracking of time was all sensibly lost while you slept. It is the feeling of a time cavity that, in waking retrospects, makes you confident you've been asleep. But while your conscious mapping of time is lost during sleep, at a non-conscious level, time continues to be catalogued by the brain with incredible precision. I'm sure you have had the experience of needing to wake up the next morning at a specific time. Perhaps you had to catch an early morning flight. Before bed, you diligently set your alarm for 6 a.m. Miraculously, however, you woke up at 5.58 a.m., unassisted, right before the alarm. Your brain, it seems, is still capable of logging time with quite remarkable precision while asleep, like so many other operations occurring within the brain. You simply don't have explicit access to this accurate time knowledge during sleep. It all flies below the radar of consciousness, surfacing only when needed. One last temporal distortion deserves mention here, that of time dilation in dreams, beyond sleep itself. Time isn't quite time within dreams, it is most often elongated. Consider the last time you hit the snooze button on your alarm, having been woken for a dream, from a dream. Mercifully, you are giving yourself another delicious five minutes of sleep. You go right back to dreaming. After the allotted five minutes, your alarm clock faithfully sounds again. Yeah, that's not what it felt like to you. During those five minutes of actual time, you may have felt like you were dreaming for an hour, perhaps more. Unlike the, fa unlike the phase of sleep where you are not dreaming, wherein you lose all awareness of time, in dreams you continue to have a sense of time. It's simply not particularly accurate. More often than not, dream time is stretched out and prolonged relative to real time. Although the reasons for such time dilation are not fully understood, recent experimental recordings of the brain cells in rats gave tantalizing clues. The experiment, rats were allowed to run around a maze. As the rats learned the spatial layouts, the researchers recorded signature patterns of brain cell firing. The scientists did not stop recording from these memory imprinting cells when the rats subsequently fell asleep. They continued to eavesdrop on the brain during the different stages of slumber, including rapid eye movement, REM sleep, the stage in which humans principally dream.
The first striking result was that the signature pattern of brain cell firing that occurred as the rats were learning the maze subsequently reappeared earnestly over and over again. That is, memories were being replayed at a level of brain cell activity as the rats snoozed. The second, more striking finding was the speed of replay. During REM sleep, the memories were being replayed far more slowly, at just half or quarter the sleep of that measured when the rats were awake and learning the maze. The slow neural recounting of the day's events is the best evidence we have today to explain our own protracted uh, pro experience of time in human dream sleep. This dramatic deceleration of neural time may be the reason we believe our dream life lasts lo far longer than our alarm clocks, otherwise asserts. An infant's revelation, two types of sleep. Though we have all determined that some someone is asleep, or that we have been asleep, the gold standard scientific verification of sleep requires the recording of signals using electrodes arising from three different regions. One, brainwave activity. Two, eye movement activity. And three, muscle activity. Collectively, these signals are grouped together under the blanket term polysomnography, PSG, meaning a readout graph of sleep somnolence that is made up of multiple signals, poly. It was using this collection of, measure, of measures that arguably the most important discovery in all of sleep research was made in 1952 at the University of Chicago by Eugen Azarinsky, then a graduate student, and a professor Nathaniel McClayman, famed for the Mammoth Cave experiment discussed in Chapter 2. Asurinsky had been carefully documenting the eye movement patterns of human infants during the day and night. He noticed that there were periods of sleep when the eyes would rapidly dart from side to side underneath their lids. Furthermore, these sleep phases were always accompanied by remarkably active brain waves, almost identical to those observed from a brain that is wide awake. Sandwiching these earnest phases of active sleep were no were longer swaths of time when the eyes would calm and rest still. During these quiescent time periods, the brain waves would also become calm, slowly ticking up and down. As if that weren't strange enough, Azurinsky also observed that these two phases of slumber, sleep with eye movements, sleep with no eye movements, would repeat in a somewhat regular pattern throughout the night, over and over and over again. With classic professional uh, skepticism, his mentor, Clayton, wanted to see the results replicated before he would entertain their validity. With his propensity for including his nearest and dearest in his experimentation, he, ch he chose his infant daughter Esther for this investigation. The findings held up. At that moment, Clayman and Asurinsky realized the profound discovery they had made. Human, humans don't just sleep, but cycle through two completely different types of sleep. They named these sleep stages based on their finding ocular features, non-rapid eye movements or NREM sleep and rapid eye movements or rain sleep. Together with the assistance of another graduate student of Clayman's at the time, William Demons, Clayman and Asernsky further demonstrated that rain sleep, in which brain activity was almost identical to that when we are awake, 
was intimately connected to the experience we call dreaming and is often described as dream sleep. And dream sleep received further dissection in the years thereafter, being subdivided into four separate stages. An an imaginatively named on dream stages one to four, we sleep researchers are a creative bunch, increasing in their depth stages Three and four are therefore the deepest stages of NREM sleep you experience, with death being defined as the increase in difficulty required to wake an individual out of NREM stages three and four compared with NREM stages one and two. The sli- sleep cycle. In the years since Esther's slumber revelation, we have learned that the two stages of sleep and REM and REM play out in a recurring push-pull battle for brain domination across the night. The cerebral war between the two is won and lost every 90 minutes, ruled first by end REM sleep, followed by the comeback of REM sleep. No sooner has the battle finished than it starts anew, replaying every 90 minutes. Tracing this remarkable roller coaster ebb and flow across the night reveals the quite beautiful cycling architecture of sleep depicted in figure 8. On the vertical axis are the different brain states with wake at the top, then REM sleep, and then the descending stages of N REM sleep, stages 1 to 4. On the horizontal axis is time of night, starting on the left at about 11 p.m. Th- uh, through until 7 a.m. on the right. The technical name for this graphic is a hypnogram, a sleep graph. Figure 8. The architecture of sleep. Had I not added the vertical dashed lines demar- demarcating each 90 minute cycle, you may have protested that you could not see a regularly repeating 90 minutes pattern. At least not the one you were expecting from my description above. The cause is another peculiar feature of sleep, a lopsided profile of sleep stages. While it is true that we flip-flop back and forth between NREM and dream sleep throughout the night every every 90 minutes, the ratio of NREM sleep to REM sleep within each 90-minute cycle changes dramatically across the night. In the first half of the night, the vast majority of our 90-minute cycles are consumed by deep NREM sleep and very little REM sleep, as can be seen in cycle 1 of the figure above. But as we transition th- uh, through into the second half of the night, this seesaw balance shifts with most of the time dominated by REM sleep, with little if any deep and REM sleep. Cycle 5 is a perfect example of this REM rich type of sleep. Why did Mother Nature design this strange, complex equation of unfolding sleep stages? Why cycle between NREM and dream sleep over and over? Why not obtain all of the required NREM sleep first, followed by all, the ne- all of the necessary REM sleep second? Or vice versa? If that's too much, show a gamble on the off chance that an animal only attains a partial night of sleep at some point, then why not keeping the ratio within each cycle the same, placing similar proportions of eggs in both baskets as it were, rather than putting most of them in one early on, and then inverting that imbalance later in the night. Why vary it? It sounds like an exhausting amount of evolutionary hard work to have designed such a convoluted system and put it into biological action. 
we have no scientific consensus as to why our sleep and that of all other mammals and birds cycles in this repeatable but dramatically asymmetric pattern though though a number of theories exist one theory i have offered is that the uneven back and forth interplay between end dream and dream sleep is necessary to elegantly remodel and obtain and update our neural circuits at night and in doing so manage the finite storage space within the brain forced by the known storage capacity imposed by a set number of neurons and connections within their memory structures. Our brain must find the sweet spot between retention of old information and leaving sufficient room for the new. Balancing this storage equation requires identifying and identifying which memories are fresh and salient and which memories that currently exist are overlapping, redundant, redundant and or simply no longer relevant. As we will discover in chapter 6, a key function of deep and REM sleep, which predominates early in the night, is to do the work of weeding out and removing unnecessary neural collections. In contrast, the dreaming stage of, of REM sleep, which prevails later in the night, plays a role in strengthening those connections. Combine these two and we have at least one parsimonious explanation for why the two types of sleep cycle across the night and why those cycles are initially dominated by NREM sleep early on, with the REM sleep reigning supreme in the second half of the night. Consider the creation of a piece of sculpture from a block of clay. It starts with placing a large amount of raw material into a pedestal, the entire mass of stored auto autobiographical memories, new and old, offered up to sleep each night. The next comes an initial and extensive removal of superfluous matter, long stretches of NREM sleep, after which brief intensification of early details can be made, short dream periods. Following this first session, the calling hands return for a second round of deep ex excavation, another long NREM sleep phase, followed by a later more enhancement of some fine-grained structures that have emerged slightly more REM sleep. After several more cycles of work, the balance of sculptural need has shifted. All core features have been hewn from the original mass of raw material. With only the important clay remaining, the work of the sculpture and the tools required must shift toward the goal of strengthening the elements and enhancing features of the which remains a dominant need for the scales of REM sleep and a later work remaining for and REM sleep. In this way, sleep may elegantly manage and solve our memory storage crises. With the general excavatory force of and REM sleep dominating early, after which the edge in hand of REM sleep blends, interconnects and adds details. Since life's experience is ever-changing, demanding that our memory catalog be updated ad infinitum, our, our autobiographical culture of stored experience is never complete. As a result, the brain always requires a new bout of sleep at its varied stages each night so as to auto-update our memory networks based on the events of the prior day. This account is one reason of many I suspect, explaining the cycling nature of NREM and dream sleep and the imbalance of their distribution across the night. A danger resides in the sleep profile wherein NREM dominates early in the night followed by an REM sleep dominance later in the morning. 
one of which most of the general public are unaware. Let's say that you go to bed this evening at midnight, but instead of waking up at 8 a.m., getting a full 8 hours of sleep, you must wake up at 6 a.m. because of an early morning meeting or because you are an athlete whose coach demands early morning practices. What percent of sleep will you lose? The logical answer is 25%. Since waking up at 6 a.m. will lop off 2 hours of sleep from what would otherwise be a normal 8 hours, but that's not entirely true, since your brain desires most of its serene sleep in the last part of night. Which is to say the late morning hours you will lose 60 to 90% of all your REM sleep, even though you are losing 25% of your total sleep time, it works both ways. If you wake up at 8 am but don't go to bed until 2 am, then you lose a significant amount of deep and REM sleep. Similar to an imbalanced diet in which you only eat carbohydrates and are left malnourished by the absence of protein, shortchanging the brain of either an NREM or REM sleep, both of which serve critical, though different, brain and body functions, results in a myriad of physical and mental ill health. As we will see in later chapters, when it comes to sleep, there is no such thing as burning the candle at both ends, or even at one end, and getting away with it.